Happy Monday, everybody. Yo! Hello. <clears throat> yes! Ahoy! Uh, I uh, spent two days not sure if I'm sick or not. Uh, I did Probably a really are. good job of, 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 of denying it and deciding it's allergies, uh, but then, you know, uh, you wake up one morning and you're like, um, <laughs> yeah, I'm sick. <laughs> <laughs> I have this rule now, like, if like you're laying in bed, I'm like, do I have to pee? I have to pee. It's like it's not. It's like no, you get up. If you're thinking about it, then you aren't. It's like if I think I'm gonna get sick, I'm sick. Yeah. Yeah. There is that level where like I probably have been sick plenty of times. In fact, every time that my wife has asked me if I'm sick, I'm probably medically a hundred percent of those times sick, but. I definitely do believe in the only 50% of the times that I admit it. <laughs> like, like, sure, there might be some germs, but I'm not sick until I say I'm sick. <laughs> right? Well, and plus also, like, if, if you want to, you know, you're cuddling on the couch watching a thing, and then you cough, and then it's like, are you sick? And you're like, what are you really asking? Are you asking, do we want to stop sitting and cuddling on the couch? Because I have an answer. No, I'm not sick. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, baby. <laughs> Just a bit of allergies. Let me wipe that green phlegm off of your face. <laughs> oh, allergies, Jesus! Yeah. Uh, Super. I think, it's, I think it's moving. <laughs> oh man! Uh, Hiroshima I'm, Pompeii nine eleven has a real just rolls off the tongue. Uh, I'm good to go whenever you guys are. Yeah. Sweet. I'm good. Okay. Then, ready? 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 Take it away in three, two. Hello and welcome to the Weird Things Podcast. I'm Andrew Main, joined by Brian Brushwood. Hello, I'm not sick. You're sick. Your face is sick. Mm -hmm. Definitely not sick, Josh and Robert Young. Hey, sick face, bro. <laughs> and Bryce Castillo. Hey. Hi, everybody. That's uh, my sick introduction. Hi. Sick. Sick. So, uh, Sick. gentlemen, is a little little Andrew centric here, but uh, I am now completely convinced that we are living in the simulation. You've always been convinced of that. What, what's the latest? Uh, yeah, you, you tasted peanut butter that couldn't possibly have been created by humanity. It had to be yeah. the, the only way <laughs> this peanut butter could be this good would be if we lived in a simulation. Oh yeah. By the way, uh, uh, patch notes. For Andrew's simulation, uh, Andrew becomes plus five aware of simulation. We hope <laughs> I mean, the updates. Brian, your 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 observations spot on. I mean, it's pretty much that. <laughs> like like you ever watch something, and you're like, I don't, like you ever in a dream, and everything's kind of like you have this thing happen. Like, I mean, this got to be a dream because I walked into the store, and all the clothes are like my size. Yep. Or, or you know, like like oh, it's Elon Musk, and he's hanging out. Wants to be best buddies with me, you know? And you're like, wait a second, this can't be life, you know? Yeah. You know I mean, I, I I got the I started suspecting this because when Marvel movies started being really good, you know, that was hmm, suspicious, you know, like. These are not not all perfect, but really good that like some of the highest rated movies like this is a little bit odd, guys. Come on, really? Um, the, we got Star Wars back was great. But then it, like in a dream, like, you know, your glasses don't work and light switches don't work, that the Star Wars movies being maybe disappointing was kind of like that part of of it was because uh, you could convince yourself Marvel movies are good because we never really had good Marvel movies before. Sure. Plus also they had... changed the, the spelling of Bernstein and, uh, and, and Mandela and, and Kazam. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It was a great movie, by the way. Yeah. R.I.P. Simbed. Uh, <laughs> so I watched a thing. Uh Oh, and I'm like, are we going straight to picks? Oh, it's going to be a pick. I watched a thing and I'm like, man, like, if if in 1999 you told me I would be watching this, I'd be like, oh, this is awesome. I wish we would have 10 years sooner. This is awesome. But this is really this is this is like this is like nerd porn for me. This was like like we're going to hit all the Andrew buttons. Bing, 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 bing. You know, and, and I'm like to the point that I'm like, all right, who's who's filming me here? Because this is really silly. Um, 
What I'm talking about was Jeff Bezos' announcement about the plans for Blue Origin and the Moon. Oh, uh, I thought you were talking about Detective Pikachu, but sure, we could talk about this. <laughs> I'm talking about I haven't seen. When I watched the world's richest man go on stage and talk about, you know, dynamism, this 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 super positive view of the future, bring out animations of O'Neill cylinders, these floating, you know, these space colonies that you know have a million people and all this. I'm watching the richest man in the world talk about how excited he's about the things I'm excited about. You know? I'm like, well this seems really weird and on point for this. What I'm talking about, my long winded introduction is Jeff Bezos did a fifty five minute, fifty minute presentation last week where he unveiled his plans for lunar and solar exploration of basically helping humanity advance outwards. And it was an extremely forward-looking, very, very positive view of the future, which, of course, means I got a ton of criticism. Um, <laughs> uh, but it was, to me, it was very interesting because you see where, as Elon Musk looks over my shoulder right now, <laughs> you got to see where Bezos is. View any of you guys get a chance to see any of this? No, but I love the idea. Like, I'm sure he used a lot of euphemisms like exploration for the good of humanity and all that. I wonder how different it would be received if he just full on said, I'm taking the moon and you can't stop me. I'm going to well, take it. Drudges. I'm going to live there and it's going to be mine. Go ahead and just start calling it Mount Bezos. Save yourself the time. I'm taking the moon. Well, he 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 made a very big case for saying, "Hey, listen, if we want to keep if we want to continue progress and progress meaning like, hey, we increase the amount of energy we use by 3% every year, if we want to continue to have people and people are I like people. I think we all like people. Not everybody likes people, it turns out though. But anyhow, you know, he says, we, we need to expand beyond Earth. And he says, like, Earth is the best planet. He made this big case. Earth is the best planet. By far, Earth is the best planet. But if we want to go expand elsewhere, where do you want to go? That's a, that's a really good point, Heckler, in the third row. I meant to add to my statement, you're welcome. You, my friend, have a place on Mount Bezos. You're welcome. You may be, yeah, exactly. bring three friends. I do, I do love also. But I got to fet them. But he, like, he does he does have to like nib high football rules is uh, the crowd in case people think that uh, Earth is not number one. Oh, <laughs> it's 20 Earth's minutes. One. Let me just say Earth's the best. Everything else is the rest. Earth <laughs> is life. He, it is literally you're watching. I'm like, man, like how much it, there, he could shave 20 minutes off of this this is real animation from here where he's showing this majestic view of this like yellowstone inside of like a big are cylinder are you sure not it's just it's not bits from his deviant art account <laughs> yep <laughs> uh so he he spent a lot of time going like hey listen we got problems on earth let me list some of them because and then you know people are like well he didn't mention this like yeah oh come on all right you know like it was just he, he he and again this is a guy richest man in the world biggest cum world you can criticize him he's open to criticism i'm not gonna you know say I'm how he's very excited that he's debuted the new art he's going to have airbrushed on his van yeah <laughs> but uh it, it was but it was you're, you're looking at you know your your smart nerdy friend from high school kind of like that what if one day we did this and yeah. now you have that guy as richest man in the world and now he's doing this so we unveiled their plans his goal is says what we need to do is build a road to the space basically you know his his play, uh, play for reusable rockets and what they want to do and a lot of them look similar a lot of it would be would hit a little bit more stronger if i don't know there wasn't another certain certain company out there but he he talked about Blue Origin School, and then he unveiled. He did it was like a David Copperfield thing. It was on the stage. They have this camera on a crane that's moving around, and he gestures towards the curtain, and the curtain pulls away and reveals. Oh, you're gonna get the moment right here, you know. And imagine some like oh, YouTube it's right there on here. stage, isn't it? Yeah, boom. Yeah. Right? He shows which is the uh, the their lander, the, the which is the lunar lander they're building, which the the. Blue Origin, the Blue Moon, which project, which is basically, it's a big ass platform designed to land rovers, space capsules, human sized rovers, et cetera, on the moon. And it uses hydrogen so that eventually, if you can build a plant on there to take the water that's on the moon and turn it into fuel, you can refuel it. He went into the technical details of it, whatever. Announced that this is their plan. They're going to be sending this thing to the moon with some payloads and stuff, and it's going to be an infrastructure that they want to make available you know hint hint 
you know, this administration says we want to go to the moon by 2024. Well, this could do it. So do you think uh, do you think? uh, Okay, so let's let's take uh, the current um, presidential administration at its word that that we want to make it by 2024. Um, Certainly, they they, uh, Bezos just made a a credible case for for why you know you might not automatically go with spacex but it uh, but surely spacex is going to get the gig right well you you need multiple parts of infrastructure so if you want to land stuff on the moon you need a way to land stuff on the moon and and that's you know they're you know spacex can get stuff into orbit and can shoot payloads towards there but this is a this is a system for landing on the moon and you know, Starship could do that, you know, would ha- take you would have to do like a couple of these highly elliptical orbits to fully fuel it up and it could land and take off, take off again. That's the thing too. Starship can actually land there and leave again. This thing would just land there and they'd have to have another module on top. Uh, hardware. It's all about hardware. Well, and, and I think that there's plenty of space to go around, boys. <laughs> like uh, uh, if, if what, Bezos and Blue Origin is pitching is like, hey, look, we're going to do this stuff. The more that the United States government wants to be involved in it, awesome. We would really love money. Uh, But other than that, this is what our plan is. We want to build infrastructure on the moon. We want to bring people to the moon. And this is every design uh, plan and rollout is going to be in service of that. Then that's their pitch. And right now, you know, the SpaceX seems far more focused on mars exploration than they do on saying like no no no, this is a thing we just we want to happen in the next several years oh no space is very clear about moon they're very very clear yeah we want to do the moon we can do the moon and starship would and they're building they're building hardware now in the form of the starship which you know could do that and the difference i would say here is that blue origin says no we're already we've already got this planned mission to spacex has sent cargo to- or sent stuff towards there but it did the, the up those the, not they haven't built their own lunar lander yet nothing like that so yeah yeah uh, are we waiting on uh, do they have to develop new types of rockets in order to make this happen because uh right now they only have like a suborbital thing right or uh, one well, there's that detail brian they, oh they do, <laughs> Is, they uh, do. That, that's on me i'm spoil sporting aren't i <laughs> yeah uh, brian um so they're building their next generation rocket. Right now they have the new Shepard, which is the suborbital one. This is very impressive, very cool. It goes up to the carbon line, comes back down, but not orbital class. They're building the next rocket, which is called New Glenn, which will be their orbital class rocket, which will be a monster-sized rocket. It'll have a pretty good payload. Still not as much as the Falcon Heavy, though. Um, and it will... Uh, they say they're going to launch this in 2021. Now, what's interesting about this presentation, I highly recommend it because... You you understand very successful people who have repeated successes or success that's lasted over a period of time often have very have a couple of things they see they look at when they see the world. You know, Elon Musk is the intersection of engineering and economics. Bezos is a lot of it's logistics. It's logistics and you know, he talks about in costs and he talks about, you know, hey, our goal is if we want to build a space industry, we got to reliably go to space. And he says that, like, our goal is with our rocket, we want if Orlando Airport's open, we're going to be able to land our rocket. And you know, to that end, the new Glenn is going to be able to land on a moving ship. The ship will be moving, so it's more stable in rough seas. And he says 2021 is when they're going to launch that. Wow. Uh, wow. I hope he's right. Yeah. Question mark. Yeah. They got they got a big ass you know big ass warehouses and you know facilities in you know Orlando. I mean, I'll tell you me, what, you man. Know, like I, can in in a war between Coke and Pepsi, it's RC Cola that wins, and and the little guys. And I'm 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 wondering who the the RC Cola is of this. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, certainly consumers because like you can uh, you can buy the 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 cheap off brand third party alternative for you know pennies on the dollar. Oh yeah, I mean, well, it's, that's a world from the from saying RC wins to the consumer wins. Yeah, we the consumer definitely win. Well, yeah, because well, uh, what I mean by this is these guys are pioneering and and they are taking on the heavy heavy hit of 
of finding out what is possible to accomplish. Once it's confirmed what is possible to accomplish, everybody else saves those billions of dollars of R&D well, because we now know it's factually possible to sure. land on a drone yeah. ship and all that stuff. And so uh, all the hangers on get to get to, to join the club. I mean, I didn't think it, it seems like from those videos that we've already seen our first beneficiary, considering like, uh, you know, we've followed Blue Origin from the first moment that Blue Origin was a thing. But some of these videos and these rockets, they sure look like what SpaceX has done so far. Like, <laughs> Well, he one of the slides he talks about is that once you have this infrastructure reliably going to space and inexpensively, he says, you know, we could have thousands of new startups, thousands of new businesses. He says, you can't start a space startup in your dorm room now. After this, you will be able to. And that's his big play. To, to your point, Brian, is saying once this infrastructure is there, and it's like, yeah, well, and he talked about how Amazon was possible because, hey, we already had a postal system. You know, we already had the Internet. We already had credit cards. He didn't have to invent any of those things. They were there waiting to be utilized. You know, what will happen once we have, you know, cheap access to space? And that's his point is like, yeah, now you're going to have all these new like I think the next big wave of the economy could be based on this. Which sounds crazy, but so did the Internet in the 1980s. So then to bring it back, Andrew. In your simulation, mm -hmm. what proves that this is more of a simulation and what proves that this is less of a simulation for you? Like, what are what are the things that happen that you're like, all right, I'm already 80 percent. Now I'm now I'm a full 100 percent. I understand that I'm living in a simulation. Well, I mean, for me, it's like I've got I've got sitting in a shelf here. I've got a. a Gerald O'Neill is the guy who first came up with the idea of these O'Neill cylinders, these big, huge things. He wrote a book called High Frontier and stuff. And it's like a nerdy sort of been a thing I've been obsessed with since a kid. And so I guess for me, it was just all. And I, I the number of people who I, I've had conversations with in person where they even knew what that the hell I was talking about was, you know, non zero, but very close to zero. And so all of a sudden, you know, I'm watching. It's like, I'm a Millhouse, too. <laughs> you know, that was my moment. Like he said, the thing, the thing that I like. You know, so, so. it's already done. Then, like, yeah. like there's, there's nothing. Like from here, like you, you've already, uh, uh, you've already gotten everything that could have possibly happened in a, in a. Uh, uh... No, I mean, I, I want, I want it to happen. I, I want this to, you know, I'm, I'm. It's still hard to wrap our head around the for me to wrap my head around the idea that you know SpaceX is building Starship right now and some Texas field that this thing could this Mars capable rocket which I you know and and then and it's like man that seems crazy then I get in my Tesla and I'm like wow this is this is a real thing you know so I don't know well here's what I do know you can support this show by heading on over to patreon.com slash weird things. Again, patreon.com slash weird things. Thank you to everybody who has supported us. And please understand that we will not leave you hanging. This is the last episode where Andrew and I are going to be on American soil. Uh, uh, we, we're, we're, we're boning out of the country. But the, oh, I see. You see one presentation on going to the moon, and now you guys just PTFO. Got it. Yep, that's it, Brian. But, uh, folks, you will not be out Weird Things content. No, we banked some episodes, and we are going to be talking all about oh, them. Oh, thank goodness. I thought you were saying we were going to introduce a new series, Weird Things, colon, left, The Leftovers. It's just Brian and Bryce. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we are like, what would Justin say about this? And then 2% of us disappear yeah. at the very beginning. <laughs> uh, yeah, the post Thanos snap. That'll be, that'll be <laughs> Weird Things in game. Uh but yeah, go ahead and check us out. Patreon.com slash weird things. So, man, where are we going to live when we go off into space? How are we going to build these things? Well, this next story may offer some helpful insight into that. It's kind of a cool thing. Um, there's this group. They haven't said where they're doing this, but they say that in some small community in Latin America... They're going to help build homes for 50 farmers and weavers. They're going to build homes for them, right? And what it is, it's a project. They plan to build these homes in 24 hours using 3D printing. The design firm Fuse Project, working with the housing nonprofit New Story and Icon, which is this the company I think that has the technology, basically they plan to use 3D printers to build these homes. And their goal is to sort of, you know, 
hey, rest of the world, homes are really cool. Like, like physical, have your own structure sort of houses are kind of awesome. And, you know, let's let's put our use to technology maybe to helping other people have the cool things that we were just lucky by being winning the birth lottery to have. So um, kind of a cool thing. Uh, sorry, is, is, is the point that a lot of people don't think houses are cool and they want to fix them or, or, <laughs> or is it just that they can make these cheaper than, than you would expect? I think the former Brian. Okay. Um, All right. Are the latter. I think it, it's, yeah, I think it's, it's the idea is that, yeah, if you know, housing, as you've seen in other countries, it's expensive and it's very difficult. And the idea is let's, let's advance the technology and make it easier to produce these homes. Uh, um, yeah, it's really remarkable to watch these things work. Uh, they're basically just squirting out uh, concrete goop and uh, and building them. And on the one hand, you know, I'm sure from a design aesthetic, it 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 uh, seeing hundreds of homes with ant like conformity uh, in in one way brings up images of you know Poland or the Soviets. Uh, but on the flip side, it also brings up the idea of safety during tornadoes and hurricanes. Yeah, it also yeah it brings up the concept of a roof yeah. <laughs> it's a really cool thing when you don't have a roof do, do we have any numbers on just how affordable this is this is being done you know and i read through the story trying to figure out if they could give an example of what the costs were and they did not and you know one of the things to think about too is that like when we if you want to go build a i don't know if you're trying to construct something let's say near austin texas um hypothetically mm. uh the things you can count on concrete companies yeah roads construction equipment skilled labor their home depot all these things that we just take for granted i mean not you but like we take for granted when we go to build a thing that are there and when you go to lesser developed countries and you want to build a thing like you know one of the you know my books on like how to make your own illusions and stuff one of the biggest markets for them were lesser developed countries because I would tell you how to build stuff out of cardboard and other materials because, you know, these would be like, no, we don't, you know, some places still don't have Home Depots. They still right. can't go get these materials. So the advantage here is the idea of like, hey, we have a simple infrastructure. We can drop this thing in place, put in a bunch of concrete, and then we can build the whole thing without needing the all, all that other housing infrastructure. Uh, that's that's fascinating. Uh, how realistic do we think something like this is? I mean, the 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 the, the idea seems like a, a logical evolution of where we are with three D printing and and everything that we've learned from there. Uh, but you know, oftentimes, and I know uh, I, I I believe that there have been some even skyscrapers in China that have been three D printed. Uh, so so at least some version of the technology is already being used on on a scale uh, from. This is the future of construction on one end to solar freaking roadways on the other. Uh, uh, where, where, where does where does this land in your mind, Andrew? I I think a form of this is gonna work. I don't I don't know that. I mean, uh, the historic. Hey, we we figured out construction. We've solved the thing that everybody else was trying to solve for a thousand years. We 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 got the answer. Those first efforts tend not to work out so well. Right. Yeah, I guess, it, I guess it would be different if it's if if their their demo video was a time lapse of them building a house and not a CGI render of what it. Well, there there is. It does seem like look, that one of the companies involved in this has 3D printed a home already in 2018. Uh, the icon in Austin. Company. In Austin. Oh wow. Yeah. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so yeah, I think, I mean, there shows some, there's some really cool looks of like much more sophisticated houses and stuff. And I think that, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm excited about a radical new technology, although we, somebody could argue like, oh, so what you're saying is you're, you're taking this sort of, you know, clay like material and laying it down bit by bit and building it up. Like, yeah, we've never seen that before. Well, Adobe's and just about every house built, you know, 4,000 years ago, um, but now robots do it. <laughs> yeah. Sure. But also, uh, you know, with 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 stylus, uh, with with style and structural integrity, uh, which yeah. I, I would say that those are those are non-zero factors that that matter. Oh yeah, yeah. We've been using forms of additive, I guess, manufacturing. You know, bricks, these things like or that are similar. You know, like the, this is a 
in existing things, so we know that works, the, the materials that are made like this are useful to build houses. Now we have a different way of reducing the labor and time in the infrastructure. So I'm excited long term, excited long term about it. So, you know, we'll see. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I hope it happens. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, I, and I love Justin the idea. Justin is just that... radiating skepticism here. <laughs> Well, no, I, I don't know. I, I, again, uh, we love we. Th this is the, the the delicate dance that is done on the Weird Things podcast. Is very often we we dabble in the the futurism and we always love the optimism, but there always is that. I mean, look, there, there's there, there's the solar freaking roadways thing where it's like sometimes it's just like like all right, maybe this is a dumb idea and I just don't know why it's dumb. So uh, let's let's say like all right. This I mean, it, it, it all comes down to cost, right? If you could t show me in hard numbers, what is the cost to erect one of these? And then more importantly, what is the cost to continue to heat and cool it? Sure. What is the cost to maintain it and all that stuff? And if th those Do you guys course... want to play a game? Because I found, I found the number for the Austin house that they made. Oh, uh, so they okay. made this tiny house at South by Southwest uh, in 2018. Okay. And we have, I have the number for how much it costs them to build. It, 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 I'm going to, I'm going to up the number because it's a prototype and say $60,000. Right, Brian says 60,000. Justin. And Brian, you, we probably should have saved you for last because you're definitely the one who has the, the, the firmest hand on what new construction looks like. And I'm working on days. it. My goodness. So, uh, uh yeah, I'm actually just going to go with Brian. <laughs> <laughs> Andrew, what do you think? I'm going to say that the number they threw out there may not be a real number, so we'll get a low. I'm going to lower. I'm going to say like 30000 Uh The number that they have here is the printed home cost was $10,000. I don't believe that. That is amazing. <laughs> like, just the slab for our steel building that we're putting up on the new Seven Acre Shwood was was more than that. That's the cost, just the slab. Icon's cost of the proof of concept was $10,000, but Icon hopes to bring it down to 4000 for a home like the one printed this week. Now, this is a tiny home, so this is this might be smaller than the ones that they're making in, uh, in Latin America, but they do say... Uh, they will average around six thousand five hundred dollars internationally. I mean, that would be a game changer if they were able to pull that off. I I don't believe it, but but if they do, that would be phenomenal. <laughs> I, I I believe they're liars. And they're <laughs> I mean, uh, I mean, I mean, beautiful lie. Because it's, it's I, just, am, am I being the bad guy right now? <laughs> no, I'm. I agree. Like, never. I'm just your your henchman at this point. I'm just, I'm <laughs> Hat. I'm just, I'm just like, yeah, tell him, because I have no clue. Like, you are the only person. Literally, if if, if Bryce were just like, hey, a hundred bucks if you can get within, you know, a, a, a spitting distance of this number, you would be the only person that I would call. So if you're like, absolutely not. That is like barely covering the concrete that needs to be the floor of mm -hmm. other construction. Then I, I agree with you. Yeah. Plus, it's got like nice inlaid wood yeah so it's they, all ikea out yeah i, I don't hard have to believe a, that as much information about you know the the wooden finishers and the electrical certainly not the real the estate. led lights uh but also you know maybe maybe I don't know, it's a, it's a small so home. but this is your way of saying andrew wins for being closest got it that, yes that um, is correct <laughs> yeah I yeah say, andrew, like, andrew was right because he bid, he, i did say i don't believe whatever number they said but it's going to be a low number because <laughs> You know, you did the um, equivalent of voting one dollar. I I'm yeah, I, I, I share all of your skepticism, but I am excited about really what this means for people in other countries and places like this, because it's so easy. Well, for and, us and to... even in this country I, and keep in mind, like, uh, I, you know, there, there's no shortage of, of, of folks who need better housing than they have right now. And and, uh, you know, it might be that. If we follow the the Tesla dynamic, then what you do is you go to people who, uh, instead of you know having a big, you know custom fancy home, tell them why not have three you know three uh, D printed homes on 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 your, I don't know, let's say anywhere from seven to seven and a half acres. <laughs> like I mean, I'm saying I'm saying there's a there there's opportunities there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, cool. You guys want to jump into picks? Heck yeah, yeah. Uh, so, y'all see that Game of Thrones last night? <laughs> Do we want to save that for after things? Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna Cersei shimmy my way 
out of this conversation <laughs> like uh, <laughs> like the game bowl is about to happen. <laughs> Uh, yeah, all right, here's my here's my pick. Uh, I got a galley copy from your friend of mine, Trey Ratcliffe, wrote a book called Under the Influence, How to Fake Your Way into Getting Rich on Instagram. And uh, <laughs> uh, it's about influencer fraud, selfies, anxiety, ego, and mass del delusional behavior. For those of you guys who don't know, uh, uh, Trey's made his bones by being a fantastic photographer, goes to Burning Man every year, takes incredible photos, and uh, sees accounts that... Um, engage in varying degrees on the spectrum of uh of authentic authenticity and uh, eth ethicality and he doesn't uh he doesn't say bad person or good person but he just sort of says these are things that people seem to be doing and these are the behaviors that you could see that uh, uh to identify what games they're playing um i i really enjoyed it i uh, he was kind enough to send me an early copy and uh kind enough to uh, uh include me in the acknowledgments but like, uh what what sorts of people are, well like like, like pump, you... pump and dump pump and dump schemes you know where uh where, where you have bots we, we talked a little bit about it uh a couple weeks ago with that dude that created the whole thing for the purposes of being able to eat mm. for free the and account. yeah where it would scrape other people's content mm. uh and and what I, what i dig about the book is like he's not making a strong value judgment he's just saying these are all the tools on the menu. Like any set of lock picks, they could be used for good or for ill. You know, stuff like uh, um, uh, taking advantage of uh, of, of uh, psychological backdoors to, uh, to to borrowing other people's content to um, uh, securing partnerships and sponsorships uh, in bad faith. It's uh, it's it's really interesting. And you know, as as somebody who you know, uh, on Twitter, I've made a big game of just being as friendly as possible, trying to follow anyone who will who will have me, and then being as friendly as possible on there. Um, it, it, it was doubly interesting for me to sit there and question, like, well, where do I fall on this spectrum? And, uh, and I think you guys will enjoy it as well. Very cool. Trey's a really cool guy. Trey's a very, very clever man. He kind of, I think he kind of pretty much was one of the pioneers of HDR. You know? you, oh yeah, I I remember seeing doing yeah. it. Uh, and La now it's like that's just what it is. That's Lon like, makes yeah. in the chat says, "I really don't understand why they don't crack down on bot activity on Instagram." Uh, short answer is because bot activity benefits Instagram. So why would you crack down on the thing that is definitely benefiting you? And uh, and you you could say the same thing for Twitter, because uh, again, there's a there's a spectrum of you know some bot accounts are are actually adding to the conversation by being fun and funny and curating uh content and and sharing and highlighting other people's work so so why would you want to crack down on any of those things you all, you also have to protect your numbers and your engagement numbers correct uh, and at times like twitter recently and it's only over like the last like two years have they taken any kind of meaningful steps toward uh, uh reducing bot activity because there were a lot of accounts and they were being judged with their stock, their publicly traded stock on how active people were and how many accounts there were. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, I got a pick. So I'm uh, going to Italy at the end of the week. Your and pick is Italy. Italy.com. It's the country of Italy. Um, <laughs> No, so I, I knew that I would be, like, ready. I'd be, like, turning my brain toward this uh, trip when I started reading. So I'm going to give you guys the two books that I am, uh, uh, I've gotten to get myself excited. The first is my pick so far, which is Sicily, as written by John Julius Norwich. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a really, really good uh, uh, history. Uh, Sicily is a fascinating island that is, uh, you know, been conquered by everybody who, uh, uh, you know, has ever conquered anything in that region. Uh, it really is. It's only been an Italian uh, uh, property for 150 years. And before that, there's just like uh, so many civilizations that have been like written and rewritten and rewritten. Uh, on on Sicily, and also I'm um, listening to the audiobook, and he's like a very uh, a, a proper British man who formerly worked at the Foreign Service, but it was only when I realized that there was a paucity of Sicilian history that I decided to put pen to paper. So he's great. I I was this close to saying the Sicilian, which is very different. 
Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Played by Christopher Lambert. Uh, but I'm I'm pumped. And then the other book I, I got is God's Bank, all about the history of uh, the Vatican and lending money. So basically, Godfather Three. That's what you're reading. You're just just you know. Basically, yeah. yeah. We're yeah we're doing the starter kit. <laughs> also, the documentary The Young Pope, highly recommended. <laughs> Uh, I got a pick. I uh, uh, fell into this over the past week after hearing uh, nothing, 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 nothing but good new, good, good, uh, good, good words about it from someone, uh, some people on this podcast, and it is the Darknet Diaries podcast. Oh, you jumped in! Yep, dude, Jack Resider is crushing it. It's pretty good. It, it's nice. Um, I, ooh, excuse me. Uh, I, I, I like it. I, I, I trust it, but I also am someone I. I feel I feel the storytelling, but I also want to feel the journalism a little more in terms of like sources and stuff, because it's it's like oh, and then they went and did this, and I'm like, well, how do you know that? <laughs> well, but occasionally he gets like um, those are like interviews. He, yeah, he, he gets right. uh, original sources, but but that's definitely how I felt. Uh, and if Jack is listening, I love you, Jack. Uh, that's how I felt when you could tell that Jack thought he was blowing the lid off of uh, uh, fraud on the. Uh, Apple iTunes rankings when, you know, ultimately by the time I was done listening, it's like, in fact, I texted him. I'm like, yeah, just turns out a lot of people don't use Apple for their podcast app. And it's just a very soft target. Mm -hmm. And and it ended up feeling a little less, you know, amaze, amaze nuts. Yeah. But uh, th this last episode about uh, LVS, about. Oh, yeah. That was a great one. Casino hack is 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 really great. There was the the Carabank. Car Ca Carbonac, the uh, ATM hack uh, from a few weeks ago. Also, that was really good. So, I really like that Darknet Diaries. Very cool. My pick is uh, the Jeff Bezos presentation. You know the about the moon. You know the uh, you can look up uh, Blue Origin Jeff Bezos Moon. There's a 50 minute presentation, but I, I I think it's well worth watching the whole thing. If if nothing else, you Jeff Bezos, love him or hate him, is a one of the most influential people in the world today, influential, good or bad, and, and making decisions that affect the lives of millions of people. And if you want to see, hey, this is what excites him. This is this is the project that, you know, when he once he's like, all right, we've got those quarterlies done. Let me go do my fun thing. This is what I want to spend my rest of my life working on. This is it. This is where his head is. So uh, worth watching. So, cool. There you go. It's been weird. Cool beans. That'll do it. Good episode, y'all. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I was literally watching the trailer for The Sicilian on Amazon Prime like yesterday going, man, do I, I've never, do I want to watch this? You know, I know it's, you know, it's, it's Puzo trying to capitalize on, you know, the Puzo name and it's just, you know, Christopher Lambert playing The Sicilian. It's like, <laughs> okay, I don't know. know uh, about it? No, 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 I, I do not know anything about it. Oh, oh, oh well, look it up. It was yeah, it was a after after you know, Godfather was such a success, was a phenomenon both as a book and obviously as a movie. It was it's why Mario Puzo is one of the writers of Superman. You know, it was like there was this Puzo Puzo fever and rushed out books like you know, was it the 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 Godfather tapes and stuff, which is him writing an account of having his book made into a movie and stuff and all these other things that got made into production because of that. Hmm. And the Sicilian was one of them. Hmm. Uh, I'll be back. All right. Yeah. Yeah. If you guys need a break. Uh, yeah. So, so we're doing after things next, right? Uh, that's right. Okay. Then. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Uh, so did you, uh, play that dick that, that, oh that i didn't i didn't I, I meant to i ended up watching game of thrones instead what was i thinking <laughs> uh is, is 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 that is is that dick red hot still it's a red hot dick right now man it's it's flying yeah i mean it's it's basically it just like doubles down on the aggro element where like in in that deck that we were playing before it like could survive mid-range and here it's like you're basically you know by turn five if you won 
and if you didn't, you can just. Oh, that's great. Yeah, I uh, uh, I don't know. I felt like as heavy as I leaned into Hearthstone, I, I just took a step back. I was like, uh, uh, gonna gonna take a breather. Oh, I want to preserve my marriage, so. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have a good Mother's Day? Um, I did. I I, I I spoke with my mom uh, for for a while on Friday, so we just spent mostly yesterday uh, sharing old photos, uh, and uh, yeah, I was listening to this uh, uh, Sicily um, book, and like, it's so funny that like the key city in in Sicily throughout this like prehistory, this is like post Alexander. As like you know, Sicily is being conquered by Carthage and uh, and yeah, various other forces. Is Syracuse? No kidding. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, that whole area of upstate New York is all named after uh, towns in Sicily and southern Italy. Oh. I uh, went and visited Bonnie. She was doing an art show, and I was like, "What are we doing for Mother's Day?" And she's like, Ugh, "I have a gig. I'm doing this art show." So after visiting my mom, I went and saw her at her art show and uh, did a little periscope where I uh, walked people through the various pieces. She's, uh, uh, in the words of uh, uh, one of my best friends, uh, she's she's a talented artist, it turns out. Uh, she's, <laughs> she's good. Um, and I love that it's gone from, for her, the, I love this thing, I'm going to do this thing. When it, uh, I'm going to do an art show. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, she, you want to uh, see my stuff? I gotta go show the thing. I mean, like, uh, for people who have not followed the journey, like, she's always been a talented artist, and, and specifically seeing the stuff that she made when she was younger, which was very conceptual. Uh, you know, obviously there's there's a, a tremendous talent there. Uh, but when she was in, when she was first doing the sculptures, it was like, oh, cool. These are like cool, kind of like abstracty sort of things but the, the the turn she has taken recently is like oh my god like this is you know this is stuff that i would see in rich people's houses <laughs> yeah 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 the uh she she did uh uh she, she's also learned uh from uh watching you know the four of us the value of uh thinking outrageously and so she knew that uh, she had to stand out in the group so she covered her booth in sod grass. So it's like you walk in and the first thing you want to do is uh, take off your shoes and walk barefoot <laughs> in this grass and then and look at her art. Um, so like many of ring those. Ringworm, the exhibition. Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> no, it's uh, I man, I'm, I'm so proud of her. And she, she was she also figured out that, um, uh, you know, she makes these really high end pieces, but a lot of people just you know, that's not in their budget. They're not in the frame of mind to do that. So she makes sure to also have for sale test pieces that led up to it. So it's like, even though it's just like a, like a, like a, a cookie of the same color combo or whatever, but it's like this, you're buying into a piece of the journey that led to this, this big impressive piece. And uh, so well, she moved a lot of those over the weekend, which is pretty good. That's great. That's like a, that's such a critical part of like it's arts and other ways things like I just want to be an artist. We got to be a business. Like my uncle's an artist and he does originals, but then he does prints, you know, and he does that. And it's like, what do you, do you want to print? Do you want, then he has, you know, all the different ways that they figure out how to market this stuff is amazing to me. Well, and, uh, yeah. so, so, uh, I don't want to spill the beans on it, but, uh, you know, we, we've had a few conversations about how in many ways, what she's really doing is selling, stories selling routines mm. se selling like um uh, oh this piece i was doing while my brother-in-law was in a coma that's why you'll notice it looks like a lung and there was definitely this moment uh that i you know when i was really inspired i i whispered into it i said you gotta wake up and i blew into this piece and two days later he woke up totally real story and uh but but also now all of a sudden the impact of having that in house now that that could be your story to tell about this piece of art that you bought exactly. at some point exactly yeah yeah because that's really what you want to do is when somebody's like oh let me show you this cool new thing i got and they're like cool like you're selling them the next sentence exactly <laughs> nobody's really happy with i bought a cool thing great <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Here, uh, I'll, I'll run to the restroom and then we'll do after things. Oh, okay. You give your mom a call, uh, Andrew. I did, and I bought her a robot mop. Ooh, oh, nice, nice. I'm a big fan. The one I have has been great, so I, I bought her that. You know, um, how about how about you? Give your mom the call. I did. Gave her a call. We talked uh, talked a bunch, and uh, you know we're going to be seeing family out in uh, out in out in Italy at, at the risk of uh, oh. feeling my complicated uh, uh, you know <laughs> racial past. Uh, yeah, we're going to be running into family out there in Italy, and uh, so we talked a bunch about kind of uh, my mom. Actually, when my grandpa died, her father wrote like a whole little like. Uh, history of uh, not only my my grandpa but my great grandfather, wow. who was the first to immigrate. Oh, wow. mm. kind of a tragic That's story. Uh, he uh, wound up uh, his wife wound up dying almost immediately upon coming out here, and uh, his kids got taken away from him from uh, you know uh, child uh, protective services, whatever version of that existed in New York City back in the day. Uh, but uh, my mom wrote all about it, and so she was like really, really knowledgeable, and is very excited for me to make my way out there and see, kind of the the prequel to that. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. There's those sort of family things are fascinating. Like my grandfather wrote a, a thing about his experience in World War II, you know, and he had, you know, I mean, very from, you know, front lines, all that sort of stuff. And my grandfather was very smart, very. It was a good writer, and it's like we need to have some sort of like. I don't know, some sort of kind of neat repository to put a lot of those stuff, those narratives. Yeah, you know, and and in a way that could kind of hold them with like respect and dignity, but sort of tell them in the thrilling way that, you know, only real history can be told, but not in a titillating way, because otherwise you're just like, all right, this is how much how real is any of this, right? Like, yeah. like you would you would need to find the right tone like like a, a a celebratory tone where you understand that all stories maybe get stretched a little bit but that there's definitely we're, we're looking for what's real in here and not necessarily for what's not mm -hmm. yeah but it'd be because it'd be neat that like i don't know i mean i just thinking of like i know there are things like ancestry.com and so like but just some something to sort of say like oh we're gonna put these books or things family journals family stuff and photos in this thing that people in the family can access and get to or you can make it public or whatever and you know, because it's like, I got to find, you know, my grandfather's story. And it's probably on like three and a half inch disc. There's probably a printed copy somewhere in my dad's study. Yeah. And I'd love love to scan that and save that because it's like, if I ever have kids, you know, it's like, hey, you know, here's a guy you never got to meet. But he's an amazing guy, you know, and this is, you know, reading his own words and you get a feel for him, you know. Yeah, yeah that's, I mean, that, the, the craziest thing is that. You know, you look, that's only, that's my great grandfather. It's not like, you know, uh, uh, you know, generations and generations and generations ago. Uh, uh, this is somebody that, like, I met my great grandmother on my father's side. Like, so it's somebody that theoretically, had he lived a longer life, you know, could have been somebody that at least saw me born. Uh, and yet, now his great grandson is gonna like screw off to Italy because he talks into a computer for a living <laughs> like, for like for laughs for like haha look I'm gonna make this journey that like effectively severed the family like I, it wasn't until Facebook that like there was just this Italian side of the family that was like oh yeah remember him huh wonder what happened whoa like and Nick Gillespie was talking about once uh, he was talking about how, like, his family, he had, like, the ones that came over, they were, like, two sets of brothers or something like this. And said so the smart ones went off to Argentina because they were going to work in cattle and all that. And he said the dumb ones were the ones that came to America because that was their ones that the, didn't have a plan. And he said, and then the ones went to Argentina. We don't know what happened to them. He's like, nobody knows. <laughs> Nobody knows what happened to them, and, and it's like, you know, the other brothers, you know, came to the one that came to America, whatever, is like, it's successful and stuff. It was just a sort of, yeah, it's like, yeah, it's like that crapshoot, you know? Yeah, and that's that's what I'm kind of excited to sort of get more into when I'm down there. It's just, like, understanding from, you know, the Italian perspective, like, what was that time like where people were just like, 
yeah, dude, uh, all this blows. Uh, uh, catch you on the flip, nerds. I'm going to move my entire life across the world. Suck. Mm. Kick rocks. Mm-mm. How dare you do this? Take me with you. <laughs> You're betraying the family. Please help send for me. <laughs> uh, yeah, apparently it came during a uh, a, a fairly crippling recession. Um, oh, in Italy? Yeah, you never... Who would have guessed? Oh. Yeah, well, you know, you kind of leave. You don't leave on an up market. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> uh, but then also just just that idea of like, you know, considering even today how much our own little tribes matter, and now they're portable because we can live them online. But it's like, you know, to just say like, all right, yeah, everything I've ever known. Uh, bye. <laughs> I'm out. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. We good to go? Uh well, yeah, what, uh, are are we doing another spoiler cast or do we... what do you guys want to do? I I'll, I'm down to talk. All right. God, I'm I'm down to got it up. All right. Okay. Then uh take it away whenever you're good. Cuz I mean, how many more of these do we have? Like four or five more that we get to talk about in episodes? There's two and we won't be live next week or the week after for the finale. Andrew, that was the last Game of Thrones. In, if, if you watch it on your your trip, that was the last one you'll ever see in America. The last new Game of Thrones episode. And I'll have to watch it on the trip because it's like an hour before this one went on, like, you know, aired on the West Coast. Spoilers in RSS feeds and stuff, you know. Oh. You know, we need to talk about blank. It's like, all right, just, just. Oh, yo, you got to watch East Coast. Yeah. You have to watch East Coast. Yeah. Stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right, ready? Ready. Ready. Hello, and welcome to the After Things Podcast. I'm Andrew Main, joined by Justin Robert Young. Hello. Brian Brushwood. Oh, hi. And Bryce Castillo. Hi. Hi. So, gentlemen, uh, we're going to jump right in. It's another spoiler episode. Spoiler spoiling, cast. Spoiling, spoiling. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna spoil. We're gonna talk about Game of Thrones episode last night. Our apologies to anybody who hasn't had a chance to listen to it. This is the the, the penultimate episode of Game of Thrones, um, and we're gonna talk about our reactions. Uh, before we begin, headline from Rotten Tomatoes says, "By the numbers, Game of Thrones final season is officially its worst, according to the Tomatometer." And uh, at this point, they said. Doesn't even matter how the last two episodes, including last night's, do. Like, even if they're a hundred percent, the average for the season will make it the worst season of Game of Thrones. Uh, By the numbers, I'm, that's we. I, I yes, I. <laughs> the, the, the science is in, sir. Uh, uh, the numbers don't lie. Uh, look, I we we can debate the relative artistic merits of this season. And uh, I think that based on our prior conversations, we certainly all had uh, uh, some some thoughts about what happened in episode five. But we can either have this conversation before or after we talk about the episode itself. The the, the worm has turned when it when it's come to uh, the the public perception, the fan community around Game of Thrones. It has hardened on a level that I can't remember since. I mean, maybe Lost? Sopranos got a little bit of it because the last few Soprano seasons were, like, very ponderous and, and kind of stupid. Uh, but, man, it, it's it's weird to watch. You know, you either you either die the hero or live long enough to see yourself become the villain. Well, I, and, and, and I, I do find myself uh, uh, conflicted because, quite honestly... This show has earned the ability to phone it in for the last season and, and, and to coast across the finish line. Like, I am 100% okay. I am happy for the time we had. I'm amazed. It, number one, it's amazing anything ever gets made in television. It's doubly amazing that anything good ever gets made. And it's triply amazing that anything stays good as long as Game of Thrones stayed good. But there does definitely seem to be this line we crossed where at some point we're not drawing on the books and instead we're relying on TV writers and we're now in TV writer land. 
who just have a different set of skills, who think in terms of set pieces, who think in terms of visual designs and wedging in like, oh, and it would be great to see this and then see that because those two things would look good when seen together. Whereas much of what came before was was so much more narrative driven. I'm. I I will defend the writers on this show as apart from other TV writers, and I will say that that they've they have worked from outlines on so much stuff before, and they were doing good seasons working off of outlines. I would make the argument that in in most successful TV shows, once you know, once they say we're guaranteed and we're going to end the season at this season, that's when I know they've left the building. They'll be there. They'll show up in their offices. They'll read scripts. But they are now, oh, we're going to go do a show about Confederates. We're going to go write a Star Wars <laughs> trilogy. And that's Andrew, my, my issue. Name one specific example of a case where in a different scenario, somebody might have had more attention uh, and maybe, I don't know, eliminated a Starbucks cup out of a scene. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that's so. My argument's been then, like, like that. That yeah, like, I think it's when really talented people phone it in. You, you sometimes at first don't realize they're phoning it in because because I think these are exceptionally talented people, but it's been phoned in. And then, and then my argument's been that like I've been saying that like I see this because the things where when there would be more eyes watching keep slipping up, and we've had the super dark episode, which again was great, was great for me, but that was a. Nobody was going, is this going to be, let me go try a little compression. Let me go, because I'm worried about this thing because I'm worried about the future of the show. That didn't happen. Then the it, Starbucks it, thing comes. I, like, I get these things happen on set all the time. My point is like, how does this end up on set? It happens on set all the time. They fix it in post. It's easy. It's fixed in post all the time. Now, then I'm, and I was waiting for like, what's going to be the big gaff on this show? Well, we have our one of our big gaffes on this show. Jamie Lannister, before he died, got his hand back. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, I did not see that. <laughs> yeah, it's just, it's just got his, his flesh and blood right hand is back. And it's like, maybe there hasn't been as many, we haven't been looking. There have been gaffes in earlier episodes and seasons and stuff. But every episode now has, hey, here's the big thing. Because when they sent out the, the digital versions to be proofed by the, you know, the EPs and stuff to look through this and who's doing the final sign offs. Yeah, maybe not getting as much scrutiny. Yeah. Yeah. You know, but but I would say, Brian, to me, the problem is not necessarily that's hilarious. Uh, the, the, the problem is not necessarily that it's like, OK, well, TV writers have a different sensibility. It, it's that the TV writers have these pegs on the wall of like, all right, well, when we all sat down with George in Santa Fe and he spilled his guts on the, the bones of the story and where things are going and specifically has these like this is how this person dies this is where this person's going this is where that person uh is is going to happen and you even hear them in the little uh, uh things that they do afterward where they're like yeah we've known for a while that blank happens that this person does this that this person dies in this kind of way now we have the leeway to show you what that looks like and we can put it in the the, the place that we want but this is what's going to happen to me Every part, and, and this episode had the most of them, every element of this season where I felt like, oh, well, that seems odd or uh, uh, weird or kind of counter to at least how I felt about these characters have come because the characters need to hit these paces. Uh, and yes, could you have more artfully done it? Probably, but they haven't. And uh, uh, to me, the the shining example of it is like, uh, Cersei shimmying past the hound uh, uh, because she's like, oh, God, I, I, I lost track of time. I got to be at my set piece uh, uh, because that's how I die. So uh, and Jamie's like, ah, oh, crap, I'm already I'm all the way in the north. I, I got to just bone out. I'm, I got to go, <laughs> man. I got to get to this set piece, dude. Like uh, and I got to actually I got to I have so much to do because I got to get to this set piece with my brother. I got to get to this set piece with Euron. I got to get to this set piece with with Cersei. Like ah, I am jam packed. Woo. It really did. Yeah, feel that way. <laughs> I, I mean, I'll, I'll defend the writers because Benioff and Weiss, who did these last couple of they are good writers. They are really and, and got their starting, you know, uh, Benioff got to start in film. Yeah. You know, and like, ever seen the movie Troy, by the way? Yeah. I that, love Troy. 
yeah. The choice is solid. He wrote that, you know. I'm mean, again, who know in Hollywood, who knows who really writes anything? But anyhow, um, but yeah, I do think it's like it's just all right. We're paid through the season seven. Nothing we can do is going to really screw it up. It's not like we're going to get canceled. We've got this thing. We're done. And that's because remember, once you start hearing about them being attached to other projects, that's when you go, oh, okay. Well, they're not in that office every day. Yeah. Okay. Can can we uh can we skip to the part where we nitpick a bunch of things that drove us nuts about all this? Uh, starting uh, starting with the fact like they they built up a really interesting, credible stalemate with the scorpions like because they invented trebuchets or 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 uh, ballistas or whatever like great well, you know uh, can we can we settle that debate by the way because because is it a crossbow or is it a ballista because you know there's been some controversy over that oh has there i, I i'm unfamiliar with a with a controversy oh, well, oh, some people I, call them what's that yeah I, w- I was just gonna say by the way I have never, never seen, and you could hear, you you will know they're coming over the the hilltop when the bristles of their neck beard, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> create the, the the skittering sound of death. Ah, medieval munitions experts. Yeah, exactly. Got, this has been your time. <laughs> the trebuchet should have been inside the walls. Have you never let a siege, good sir? I, I, for me, I'm more concerned with the storytelling aspects of they built up a credible stalemate, yeah. and then so just... we won't. We'll just jump right past. That's cool. Uh, oh, 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 I'm sorry. Uh, what else is to, is is to it, say? Is it, is, is it a crossbow or or a ballista? Do we I know? just, I know it doesn't matter. I was just just saying, but it is one of those. The, the, I, I would say some of the fun of the show is the minutia of it in the discussion, and and again, yes, well, the storytelling is the most critical part. But I've just every time I hear that. That well, but kind of thing, and and let's we'll skip right past it. They're effing crossbows. Move on. Yeah. Well, and and uh, but but from a storytelling perspective, they they had uh, put us in a in a very complicated place where they were at a stalemate. Where I don't know, maybe it would be time to have a awesome, well written conversation between Cersei and Daenerys. They even about, say evening the the sides right? multiple times. Yeah, 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 that'd be great. But instead, just shrug. Uh, uh, yeah, but I don't feel like evening anything. How about just dragons are awesome, and that's the end of it. <laughs> Who loves 9-11 imagery and go also Pompeii and Hiroshima and also, man, we don't like Daenerys anymore. That was a fast turn. I, 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 I've argued that turn has been well coming, but I, I, it felt a lot like when they sit over the, 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 over like Dragonstone looking at the board and the pieces, it felt a lot like the writing was like, grab these pieces off, grab these pieces off. Okay. Now go story, you know, like. We got crossbows. Knock them out. Okay, done. Now story. And that that is frustrating because it is like we need to get everybody to the next set piece. It's like a Zack Snyder film. You know, it's like, well, you know, how we got there doesn't matter. And specifically since this is, you know, in, in so many ways, you have to deal with the idea of the Battle of the Bastards or not the Battle of the Bastards, the Battle of Blackwater. One of the moments that I think the show very much announced itself in season one where it's like okay let's explain what how in how how immersive and amazing a sack of king's landing would look like and what is it going to take to defend the city and now that you have like okay now it's the opposite now Tyrion, the man who masterminded how to repel an army that should have sacked king's landing now he's on the other side but you know we don't really get a whole lot of him saying like, oh no, you got to go through these kind of things. Like there's always been an element of tactics to Game of Thrones that has enriched it. And they've been great storytelling wise to explain like, okay, well in, in the books, it, it, it's the chain that, that uh, uh, hampers Stannis's boats in, in the battle of Blackwater in both of them. It's the idea of the dragon fire uh, of, you know, now burning, you know, adding a, a, a complication that keeps things at bay, literally. Here, it was like, oh, okay, so we've already seen, we've demonstrated the stakes of those scorpions. The one dragon's dead. Now, what do you do? Do you try to sabotage them? Do you do you try to, you know, fly around so you're exhausting the uh, the 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 uh, ammunition? Ambition? Yeah, and it's like, no, yo, you just take the dragon, you just blow fire on him, it's def- you know, boom. I don't know why you're so stupid. Just throw, you have a dragon. Just breathe fire. And there, there, there was an awful lot of like, um, 
uh, stuff that didn't seem to pay off. Like to me, the best scene of the entire show was the face off between the unsullied and uh, the golden company. And in that gulf between the two, we all knew what useless, uh, what a useless face off this was going to be. And then they did exactly what I hoped uh, dude throw, throw the short sword down. And, and it's like, yeah, I would too. Great. Maybe we don't have to watch just rampant murder and everything. But then there was just a like, shrug. We're like, well, we're here to murder. So let me just me, 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 and, and take everybody out. Um, and wait, wait, so you, wait, you're, you, I mean, I, I mean, I, story-wise, I like that, that it was like Jon Snow watching, you know, he, him w- watching things lose control, the people, his allies becoming murderous. And, you know, I mean, I, I liked, like, I liked, like, oh, cool. They threw it down. And it's like, ah, oh, it has an end. But then Daenerys becoming what she's been all along, <laughs> you know, then, then it's like, then all of a sudden that battle cry. I like that part. Yeah. yeah I, mean, I think it, it's, it's. It to me, it was that was the only thing that felt like oh okay the the show has been so good at bringing us into a realistic medieval quote unquote or a realistic medieval scenario that also has these fantasy elements right and so the idea of you know part of the military saying like no 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 we're here for regime change so the second that they realize that they are outmatched we believe that we are going to outmatch them. Uh, we will, uh, uh, you know, they're going to ring the bells. We will go. Well, you know, you, look, Cersei, you can light her on fire. You can throw her out the tower. We don't care. We just want all these innocents to be okay. Uh, as soon as Daenerys flipped that switch, it's like, okay, what does it feel to go from a modern, uh, humane military idea to, no, this is old school, like Dan Carlin, hardcore history. A town is being sacked. Like, this is all about, this is looting, this is raping, this is brutality, the likes of which we have said goodbye to. And the fact that it's the Unsullied and the Dothraki, I mean, the, 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 the Dothraki you can expect it from, the Unsullied are going to go where Daenerys is going, and that's that. You know, that's that's where that's where I, we are. That, that, that and and, and to, uh, it, to this episode's credit, that um, calm before the storm... Like, I really deeply felt like, oh, my goodness, what must it be like to be one of the small folk knowing that a storm is coming and that there's nothing you could do? And and, and it made me think of uh, uh, back to Dan Carlin territory, you know, where it's like you would have entire weeks where you would just watch people building attack towers in front of your city uh, before they they stormed in and took whatever they wanted. I mean, that 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 was very well represented. I, I guess I'm just more bummed. For our core characters, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. the people we love the most, number one, I felt like uh, Varys deserved better than to go out the way he did. I feel like uh, 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 Tyrion probably should do something besides walk around looking c- confused. I, <laughs> I expected Cersei to have literally any plan at all. Uh, and uh, and uh, I, I thought the Hound's uh, attack on his brother really lost its mojo once once it was clear that he's a animatronic robot at this point and that there's nothing inside of him that's worthy of killing so I, I i don't know it was just a weird place for me i i felt like everybody just got dumber just everybody's dumber you know and that that's like i'm i loved Tyrion. i'm i i'm like everyone Tyrion's i'm shut up dude like you're you're like you're really not you're you keep doing the same you're in westworld robot mode keep doing the same speech and things like this and you know and it's funny too because like you know they you could see what they're the, i don't know some of the ham-fisted stuff because like we've been told how smart sansa is we've been because people have to tell us how smart sansa is because we haven't seen her do anything smart but now she's supposed to be the smartest person in westeros because you know she like hey guess what my brother really is you know that's been her big contribution this season is that and then with you know the bell like the thing with the bells like that was reinforced in our head at dragonstone like if the bells ring stop attacking if the bells ring stop attacking and so by the time you know daenerys is up there on the dragon and the bells ringing and that was supposed to it was like i don't know i mean it's like some of it's just i just wish everybody was smarter nope I, 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 smarter. I, 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 you and me both that's it's it's the game of throat literally the name of the show is 
tactics and political intrigue. And you, you have a very rudimentary version that I think we all kind of expected was going to be the base of a more complicated plot of uh, like, oh, well, Tyrion's doing this, but, you know, maybe he's got some other allegiances or where Cersei is trying to, uh, you know, she she is, uh, you know, shacked up with Euron because there's a larger purpose that she has. She does have a plan, right? She, the, the, there's, uh, she's, she's trying to outthink Daenerys or use Westeros to her advantage in, in some way. Sansa is like, okay, well, she's the little finger, right? But imagine if little finger had the righteous purpose of, I want the North to be free. I want to create Scotland, basically. Uh, like, what would she do? It, it, now, at that point, there is no binary, uh, oh, I'm for this person, I'm against this person. I'm for whoever gets me a free land. Uh, and we, to your point, Andrew, I think you're right. We kind of just have seen precious little of it beyond, like, okay, so John is a Targaryen. Uh, he's going to watch Daenerys be mean and a murderer. So he's gonna be mad. All right. I. Oh. No, we only other, have one episode a, left to clear all this up. What are they doing? Another. Well, that was my frustration about the other episodes, like like a couple episodes ago. I'm like, I'm like, I'm worried because the pacing here, like, I don't see how they're gonna wrap it up the way they're doing. And here's here's my, and I don't, I don't know, like. When I watched the battle for Winterfell, I really again I loved that episode. I really loved it, and I loved it when I watched all the Dothraki just get snuffed out and die. Lights out. Yeah, and I'm like amazing. The Dothraki are off the board, and the Unsullied like there are twelve of them left. It was amazing. And then I realized that I was watching like Voyager, and and no, we need as many Doth we have as many Dothraki as we need. We have a Dothraki machine, you know. We have we have a Unsullied machine. Like we've no, we've got a lot more. I know we made it look like we almost we got decimated, um, or what's what what's when nine out of ten get killed? I don't know. But then it's like and it's like wait wait, you made me think that you like had nothing, and then now I'm watching the sack of the city with like uh, pretty some full on forces and stuff. Yeah, because there was that moment at the end of uh, uh, the Battle of Winterfell, where you're like, oh crap. Like now Cersei really has if you take the dragons off the board and or assume that they're injured, that like that's really take take them out and and they have no chance. Like they can't siege the city with uh, uh, those people. And then the next episode, they're like, well, now we're about even. It's like, oh, like. Even in terms of manpower, like we're yeah, uh, we're like we're we're even. Now. You know what? I, I I think you guys are getting me uh, angry at at the storytelling because you're right. They they were onto something there. It's like neutralize the uh, 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 the silver bullet that would have let. Uh, we were on track for a very simple narrative of of a of a powerless girl who becomes powerful, then realizes that she needs to learn how to rule. Also, she has magic bullets uh, in in the form of dragons, uh, and uses magic bullets to to uh, save the day. But but weirdly, like Cersei did nothing this entire se season that felt particularly nasty. That felt like she needed to be unse uh, unseated. She banged uh, Euron, uh, which was pretty. Uh, pretty what's gross. that? She banged Euron, which is pretty gross. I uh, well, I mean, he, yeah, he's <laughs> gross, but also not a credible threat, and also a weird fanboy of Jamie Lannister. I, I, I don't understand that. Um, it, guys, guys, it's a bad season. This is a bad season. I'm not gonna say it's as as confusing and awkward and as dumb an ending as uh, Battlestar Galactica, but uh, it's close. Like, oh, we're, BSG was only the like the last five minutes. You take that off. I agree. Thought, I agree. I agree. Yeah. Like, like they, 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 uh, but it's, I, I, I think it's a bad show, guys. I think this I, season I, is I'm a not, bad I'm show. Not, I'm not like I think it is. It is bad compared to our expectations, and unlike something like Lost, where I think that there was a similar explosion of resentment because folks were like, "All right, this has a." answer right you guys know where you're going and they're like yup yup but also how does stepdad get here and is there a pirate around there's a pirate ship and there's also like real world uh things there. there's a bomb i don't know is it quantum mechanics we move the island this is crazy <laughs> I like it's like, oh, it's yeah, like no we know and then it's when it's revealed to be like oh this is another side stupid thing like screw you guys i think it was like 
we literally let ourselves be lied to. You know, the the thing was there was what's his face, the 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 villain cool guy was like all right, Jack, imagine I have a box and anything you want I can pull out of that box. Okay? What would you want? You're like, oh, cool. This box sounds amazing. And that was really the Avery's like, no, there is no box. But the idea that I had a box was cool, right? Yeah. And so, hey, dragons are cool. We're watching dragons. We're getting, you know, dragons. And I don't know. I just, because you think about like, hey, how would you, dragons are kind of like airplane, like Nazis dropping bombs on you. I don't know, basements and the stuff where they kept all the, the green fire. I mean, you could have you could have had clever things done. You could have had Cersei could have done the whole it's like, you know, use the like, let's put most of our troops subterranean and we'll ring the bells and they'll come in and or, you know, or, or give us some kind of surprise. I, I the word that keeps going through my mind is empty. Uh, Cersei and Jamie, Jamie's death was empty. Kyburn's yeah. death was empty. The vengeance of the hound against uh, the mountain was empty. Uh, I, 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 Arya's presence in King's Landing was empty. The threat of the scorpions uh, against the dragons was empty. Everything, like, 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 I, I, I got, I got nothing out of this. Even and and plus, also, like, the one person that I feel like we're all supposed to rally around is Jon Snow, and he was too busy looking confused and being useless. Same, same with Tyrion. I thought, I thought Varys's death was empty. Everything felt empty, hollow, and pointless. And maybe. Maybe that's what they're going for. Maybe that's the whole point of the show is to remind us how empty, pointless, and hollow people uh, seeking power is. I, I think I think what what you what you uh, uh, hit on is the problem is that this was not necessarily an issue where we felt this was like building with Game of Thrones in like oh well you guys don't know what you're doing. We knew kind of in general, if you just were to list off before you watch the this season, right? You were to literally just list off the big events. Arya kills the Night King. Jorah dies by Danny's side. Uh, 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 Jamie and Cersei uh, die clutched together in, in the bottom of uh, the Red Keep, like amongst the... The, the skulls of the old dragons of, of, of the literally Tungary. clinging to power to the last. Yeah. It's like, if you were to just read that out loud, you'd be like, Oh, this is going to be dope. This is going to be awesome. Like, look at all these cool things that I've, I can't wait until I see all these moments. And the problem is that the execution just isn't there. They're, like all the, like the, 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 the tissue that binds it is, is just missing. And, uh, that's where I, I kind of wonder at a certain point, should the show just have been something totally different? Because I think based on Amelia Clark's performance, people love Daenerys. People love people find her humanity, I think, more than George R. R. Martin finds her humanity in in the book as a character. It, it, it makes more sense to me because the world is a little bit more brutal. Everyone's a little uglier. Uh, uh, that that the world in his writing is like, no, she becomes a tyrant because on one level, you can't really be running around with a dragon and not breathing fire on people. Uh, and number two, like that's just her character. But in the show, I think we wanted to see we we see her humanity more. We wanted to see the moment she snaps uh, uh, in in a more emotional yes. way. T take me yeah. along for that journey. Make me understand why she's bad now. But, but, because but, but, you could do that. You could do that. To, to Andrew's point, everything's there. She's literally not met a problem where she hasn't said, well, let's light them on fire. And somebody said, uh, my liege, my liege, uh, do consider the other idea of not lighting them on fire. And she's like, well, if you screw this up, I'll light you on fire. Not to uh, mention the first 20 minutes of this episode where all of the men in her life failing her again or yeah. or, or betraying her. Uh, or actively trying to poison her, like I guess they were insinuating with Varys uh, at, at the very beginning with the, with the, oh, the child in the kitchen. Yeah. Um, you know, so it's... it's oh, wow, I, I totally know. didn't even pick up on the I didn't active pick that attempt up point. Yeah, I didn't pick up on that at all. I, I assumed it was like, uh, take care of her, take care of her. Well, she's not eating. Well, what can you do? That uh, makes so much more sense now. Yeah. That makes more sense. I, yeah, I mean, I've been... I mean, I've said this again, but like I've been... Her turn to me was seen where it was headed several seasons ago because it's just 
you just saw she became more and more of a tyrant. She became more and more of a tyrant. And then, you know, in last season when she killed Samuel Tarley's family, just when she didn't need to, it was just clear. It's like, yeah, it's going to be that this show is going to be about feeding her that she's going to be the bad I, one it, at that moment i was like oof wow that's a, well to me that moment felt like um if i'm being generous it was reminiscent of when ned stark explained to Jon snow of like hey man you got to administer justice and you have to have the rule of law and sometimes that means you need to be the one to cut off the head so so in in my mind in that moment i thought that that's what they were trying to represent where it's I, just like uh, you got to bend the knee this is up I, to I, you I, I, that you guys are both right, which is why this show is rad, is that Andrew is 100% right. This was an unnecessary killing. Brian is 100% right. You can't uh, bring me through this lady's journey from being a shy young girl to being a strong leader, watch every single failure that she's ever had, and then show me what a piece of garbage this guy's, uh, uh, th this this father, uh, this lord is to his son that we've spent so much time with and loving uh, loving every moment and not be like, oh, yeah, I get it. She's good. Uh, he's an a-hole. Oh, man, she really went overboard by burning the, the brother, too. But, uh, you know, a-hole, good guy. A-hole's got an a-hole. <laughs> like, we, emotionally, we, we gave her credence for that and that's what's kind of what makes it a fun and complex show is that it's like when you really just look at a record you're like oh god yeah no i mean throw in a little bit of uh depression because your son your your dragon son got killed uh you know and uh now all of a sudden you win you realize that winning doesn't feel like it should to you and you're like no you want to know what uh, all everyone's gonna do if i walk in there uh, and just say, ah, you, look at me, I'm the new queen, everybody hooray, then all anyone's going to do is say, well, but also Jon Snow should be the king. And now that we're all here, let's understand that he's got a better claim to the throne. If it doesn't happen today or tomorrow, it'll happen in two weeks. If it doesn't happen in two weeks, it'll happen in two years. So I'm going to show them why you never screw with me. I mean, I'm going at, to. At, at this point, I almost wish, I can't believe I'm saying this out loud, I almost wish instead of having Cersei just stand in the red keep and, and watch destruction rain around her, I would have loved, I think I would have loved to see some trick and to see her kill Daenerys, kill Jon Snow, kill all of our favorite heroes and have the end of the show be, uh, that's right, man. Uh, 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 you're playing for keeps when it comes to the game of Thrones. Like, I don't know how they land this in anything close to a satisfying way to me at this point. I, yeah, I mean, once we got the Battle of Winterfell, my issue is like, hey, this seems like the most important battle for several centuries because Cersei eventually will get old and die. And if she's anything like her mother, she'll probably, you know, having, having you know, if, you, if, it's, if it's your brother's child, you might die during childbirth. I'm like, seriously, like, you'll endure Cersei and then the world will move on. The Night King, that's the thing that would have ended the world. So it kind of like this, it's like, Eh, I'm going to watch a bunch of people die. And to me, it's sort of like, I really think this is the wrong reversed order. Oh, you know, I, I, I think you nailed it. Uh, uh, the Night King was my favorite monster in the show. Once mm -hmm. he was out of the picture, I was like, well, I guess Cersei needs to be the most credible, greatest monster in the show so I can enjoy watching her die. Totally failed at that. And now I guess I'm left with, all right, Daenerys, can you, can, can you be a monster, I guess? I'm, I'm not super into it, but... We only have one episode left, and I need to see some monster go. I guess that that to me, I, I I can I can I can buy the the Night King thing. It's like all right, well, it's a shock in in a show that has defined itself by shocks, right? It was a shock with three episodes left to go that we eliminate such a gigantic piece of the puzzle, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and it's like okay, well then even if we're going to look at these last. Uh, 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 two episodes rather uh, or three episodes as uh, well now this is almost like an epilogue to this thing where now we're going to find out where all these characters uh, go after certain death has been avoided how, how do we deal with the people that didn't pitch in at the time uh, then there's there's I think still a lot of meat on that bone there it's just you know how are we getting there again the moments are the moments uh, because the moments are the moments that we probably 
would have won it. And and uh, this this to me has never really been about the surprise ending as much as it's like show everybody being smart. Like it's been a while since Tyrion smart. It's been a while since, like, again. How is Tyrion and Davos the like literally the 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 military minds on either side of the Battle of Blackwater? The last time that King's Landing was attempted to be sacked. Davos saw everything that came from the Stannis side. Tyrion saw everything that came from the the Lannister side. That they're like that we're not like spending time being like, okay, well we're gonna do this and it's gonna be clever. And uh, we I need to counter the idea you that know, what Cersei's gonna do. Yeah, that like it's disappointing too. It's like you gave Arya these superpowers that I understand she can't always have, and she's got this face changing superpower kind of thing, and we keep waiting for that to be the thing that like. How she's gonna kill Cersei or try to get close to it, and you know, and I kept hoping that like when Jamie Lannister came to Cersei, I'm like, please let it be Arya, you know, to slip the knife in or something. That would have been satisfying. And instead, they used Arya as a way to make us feel empathy for what showing the siege from the ground level was great, and using Arya as a way to do that was really clever. But uh, you wasted. We spent all this time watching her develop magical powers that ended up not playing any part in anything in the season. The the special, the face stuff and the magic and all that. Yeah. No, yeah, the the the, the face glamour that was you know, it's not like she pretended to be a White Walker and and then was like Yeah, it, it was used to kill Frey, you know, like I which I kind of think like all you have to do is hide inside of some giant birthday cake that he thinks a stripper's inside of to kill Walter Frey. Like I don't think it's really that hard, <laughs> you know? Well, no. and also, really, that was she didn't even do it to kill Walter Frey. Like she, she could have poisoned the wine and then just peaced out. Like that was her touchdown dance. Was like, look at me, I'm gonna use this. I'm a prop comic now because I killed all of you with poison, uh, and now I'm gonna be like, aha! But it was also I was looking at you. Yeah, that was yeah. Arya was a weird, and I think ill-fitting choice for our boots in the ground representation of watching 9-11 happen. Um, they firmly established that she has a hardened heart. Uh, if you had given me Samuel Tarly shocked and amazed trying to save people or, or Gendry or, or, uh, you know, even, even, even the hound, you know, out of his element and afraid. I mean, you know, I, I, I would have rather have seen the hound running around trying to save people out of his element than that silly battle with his with his undead golem brother. Uh yeah, you know, I I just don't know where they want to go with Arya, where it's it's like, okay, so I like her being the person is like, all right, we have built all this up. We have made her super uh, uh assassin lady. Uh and like this is, you know, we we get our own perverse kind of like coming of age story in the battle of Winterfell and the run up to it where she sleeps with Gendry. And then it's like, this is her winning the, 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 the big regatta in, in like the, 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 the teen comedy is her winning, uh, you know, the, the battle. It's like, okay, well then now she's leaving and she's going to go kill Cersei. But then Sandor's like, yo, I'm going to die. And she's like, cool, man. Thanks. Right. Well, shucks. Got so close to kill. I guess, I guess, like, I mean, I, I met maybe, I guess the payoff is maybe going to be that, you know, she's going to, we're going to steal the face thing and she's going to become Grey Worm and kill Daenerys or try or something. Or maybe, I think we'll probably see some, it'll play off next episode for that. Yeah. I mean, you saw a lot of, you know, and again, there's moments where it's like the, the, again, everything that happens is fine. Like, I don't think that there's been a moment, a, a, a decision, a place where somebody died, a place where uh, a, a big major event happened uh, that I was like, no, that can't be it. Uh, it's just getting to him. That is, is like every time that I've thought there was more intelligence uh, uh, between the decisions, there hasn't been. And yeah. Every every time that I was like, you know, even last week where I was defending the. The, the 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 parlay with the you know the arrows and the scorpions and the dragon and everything like oh why don't they just massacre him I'm like oh well because uh, they've clearly set up that you know uh, Cersei needs to hold on uh, to whatever lords are still 
uh, vital to her. And, and so that's why the case. So I assume that part of the tension of this siege is going to be her holding everything together and demonstrating her conniving uh, a way of doing things. And it's like, no, I'm just going to do the terrorist move of bringing a bunch of innocents next to me. And then I'll wait. Yep. I'm just going to look out this window and wait for my ticket to come in. Yeah, I I, I, I don't want to fall into too far of a rabbit hole of us just spinning around on what might have been. But but I do feel like at this point, man, I would have loved some kind of rallying cry of why we need a, an Iron Throne to begin with. And, and, and a reminder of like uh, there are existential threats and there are great people who can sit there and all that. And, and they're not doing any of that. And that's, that's well, a bit of a bummer. Yeah. I mean, I, I've been arguing that like, I think the point of the show is to get rid of the throne that you don't want, you know, why, what? why have this? That's, been that's what thing. I thought, but, but, but they're not setting up any reason to do it. I, 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 uh, I mean, look, uh, uh, trust it. Uh, trust me. This anarcho libertarian would love nothing more. But it's like, yeah, let's melt the throne. That's the answer. We did it. We're all free folk here. Come on down free folk. We're, we're all going to work things out together. Uh, but it doesn't feel like that's going to happen in the next episode. <laughs> Well, I mean, we what we've set up was the the liberator became worse than Cersei by uh, a million fold. You know yeah. what 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 Daenerys did in a few hours is worse than anything Cersei ever did. But, Cersei, and, but also in like it was it was fairly. I couldn't even understand it from her perspective why she was doing that, and so in that regard, she was she was because... kind of a bad villain. Well, well I mean, I, that, I, that, I, I, that, I, I she, what's that? I, I bought. I mean, as soon as yeah, she. Like, like John, John Snow is the love of the people of Westeros. And she's like, if I can't, like, when she's like, oh, it'll be fear then. To me, that was her saying, like, no one's overthrowing me. I'm she's taking- still angry that, like, her, you know, she still carries that animosity. She lived in exile because those people rejected her, because they didn't reject Cersei, because of that. So she hates them. She hates them because, you know, she liberates the other people that, the, anybody that was never an enemy of the Targaryens, but when it came to these people who, you know, she sees as just, you know, when she's talking about, you know, she did a couple episodes before, like, well, we'll bring it, you know, let them, you know, you know, we'll, we'll bring the walls down on them then if they won't accept me. And it's like, oh, she's, she's. Yeah. Uh, I see you in the chat has a really good point. Uh, there was a moment I was like, oh, well, I guess John is on the list. And the smartest thing to do is for her to kill John and just keep on moving forward. Uh, but, but, but I didn't perceive that she was you know killing everybody in king's landing out as a mercy to john <laughs> but just like she was just angry or whatever i don't know yeah again it's a, it's just i just want to know more i want to know more about why they're doing things i and uh, that's why my favorite episode of this season was the last episode where we got like these kind of ruminative conversations between Tyrion and Varys and and like we were talking about okay well what are, what are the tactics of overthrowing an ongoing coup like because uh, yeah, th- that's a fascinating thing like anytime that you have a revolution you have the politics inside the revolution and you have revolutionaries that aren't going to make you have generals that won't make good presidents or or, or will very obviously become dictators uh, that to me, those conversations, those ideas have always been what Game of Thrones is rad at. Uh, what leadership and on um, that level means. How do you solve these tricky problems? But you know, I don't know. It, so, it, 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 I, if, if to me, like just tying together. This is uh, this is the part where I get to say the same thing that I've been saying all season long. I trust them. Hopefully, they'll stick the landing. Only. Now this is their last at bat to do so because I've seen not a lot in the last five episodes. Yeah, uh, I mean at this point I don't know. Uh, the, the, a lot of the interesting kind of stuff to me has been taken off the table. Like, uh, I, you know, it's going to boil down to how do we deal with Sir or how do we deal with Danny? I don't think it's going to be good. <laughs> and, uh, you know, where do we leave the world, you know, past that as they move into winter and spoiler alert, or I mean, I don't have that or no spoilers, but if I'm going to take a guess, it's like, oh, okay. So Danny dies and the North 
is free and this is all about how Scotland was made. And cool. So uh, see you next time on Game of Thrones. And then they all wave in the camera. <laughs> Damn it. I'm so sad that you're almost certainly right. <laughs> that makes me really bummed out. Well, it's just like, because like, where else do we go? I like, don't know. Because the question is going to be, does Danny live or die? Well, I don't think she will. I don't. think or I don't think she's going to live. So the question then is, who kills her? Okay, probably either John or Arya, uh, and I'll probably be on some level because Sansa has, uh, uh, you know, directed it or did a thing that makes her seem some way Machiavellian, so we don't feel super great about the North becoming free. Uh, and then once she's dead, who sits on the Iron Throne? That's literally, and then at that point, it's like, cool, so who becomes principal after I graduate? Yeah. <laughs> like, awesome. I really think he deserved the job. He used yeah. to be the janitor. I love the fact that somehow over the last 40 minutes, this became a therapy session. And because, of, like, I mean, I think we unpacked some stuff that we didn't know that we were feeling. <laughs> no, I mean, look, let, let me just say this. The, the show has given us cinematic scope to things that I never thought was possible on television. Sure. Uh, for, for what you can say about how hollow – emotionally the the clegane bowl was like as a meme as an internet meme which is basically what it meant to me it was like the most fantasy ass fantasy shit that had ever fantasied of like you know tattered fallen uh, uh you know renaissance ruin while a dragon flies by and blows fire and there's like an undead knight and another cell sword it's like ah look at this like you know airbrush it on the side of a van it's so dope uh but you're right it, to me the, the it, it it's not anything that well what it looks like it's not anything that happens it's just the 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 idea of it being super smart is just kind of uh not there and, yeah and that's fine well whatever yeah i just you know i yeah i mean i don't i don't i never cared too much about who ended up where as long as i was entertained by how they got there exactly you, you know um that's been my thing and it's you know fanfic is about you know what happens good storytelling is about how it happens and this is just it just feels like you know like i said you could you could spot the problem once the other projects were announced for the creators and the showrunners and stuff and you're like because i think the direction for the most part's been pretty good pretty been good insane. oh my yeah. god yeah no everything's looked amazing yeah. and again it's like you know i was watching some of the behind the scenes uh, uh, stuff of like how they were shooting it and just like you know all, all the, the the stuff that kind of gets lost in the weeds is like how many people they literally lit on fire like you know it's just like these massive scenes of like three dozen people three dozen stuntmen lit on fire for like 10 minutes uh, while they're while they're shooting this kind of stuff in these controlled burns and it's like that just doesn't happen on yeah. television we don't see this this level of of like like that felt like a dragon sacking King's Landing. Like if you were to say back in uh, uh, you know episode one, uh, you know the first season, you're like, yo, they are going a dragon is going to sack King's Landing, and it is going to look exactly how you think it's going to look in your head. You mean like it yes! better than the Hobbit? Yes, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. And that that would say technically, like I watch it as way better than we watch the the Hobbit, the Dragon Siege, and the Hobbit, and all this. And all right, so let's talk about this now. Um, what 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 do we look forward to now? Oh, what, you mean what, after, how do you feel after, about the Watchmen trailer? Uh, I I I dig that they're trying a different take. Um, you know, I I liked uh, the Watchmen, the comic book. I liked the movie well enough. I know I'm in the minority on that. Um, uh, I, I also like people trying different angles on stuff, but I, I, it, it, judging from Justin's response, it seems like Watchmen might be a bit too precious for you to appreciate a, a reimagining of. No, 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 no. 
I love the Watchmen. I I thought the Zack Snyder movie was fine. A few minor quibbles about a very important line that I think they took out of a character's mouth and they didn't highlight the things that I like the most about the story. Fine, whatever. I enjoy it for what it is. Um, I don't know if this is a sequel. If it is, then I'm... I don't know if uh, uh, Damon Lindelof took the same lessons from the Watchmen that I took or if I like where he's going with it. The the cult of Rorschach, uh, while certainly effective in its, uh, you know, Visual like imagery. thing, uh, uh, I think that trailer is great. I just don't know exactly where they're going. And the if if. Where they are going is that the people that believe in Rorschach are like this weird kind of like KKK kind of thing. Like, I mean, uh, uh, I, I, hang, uh, there's room. Uh, OK, what I mean, what if what they're putting together is essentially Alex Jones Infowars.com, where it's like, no, have you read the book have you read the dossier the the he laid it all out this is the world that's been pulled out or, or pulled over our eyes take the red pill join us and understand that there was no uh, alien invasion there was no reason for us to all gather and i'm i'm here for exploring that idea but there is and i'm i'm willing to go like uh, i'll say this what am i looking forward to i'm looking forward to the watch Lost was one of my favorite shows. Watchmen's maybe my favorite property uh, in comics. Uh, so I'm excited to see where they go. Like, but man, there's just something that, that I think is so iconic about that source material is that there is, you know, Rorschach specifically is such a fascinating figure because there is a, a, a heroism in his cynicism, right? And it, it obviously as being, you know, between him and Night Owl, we see these kind of allegories to Batman. But it's like, to me, that that is the Batman idea in that original source material where it's like, hey, do you really think that Bruce Wayne like Bruce Wayne is definitely, uh, uh, you know, watching uh, uh, Fox News and writing. He's a commenter on ZeroHedge.com. Like, there's no way that that's not. A, a thing that happens in a modern era, but he's still Batman. He's everything that you know Batman. He's just as heroic. He's just as compassionate, but he has these kind of ideas. And so, I don't know. Uh, I, I'm, I'm excited to see where it goes, but the more I watched that trailer, I was like, oh, are they going to take this in a, in a place Political. that I... Yeah, and I, that's the other thing. It's just making it a one-for-one one thing where that was the the brilliance of Watchmen, why Watchmen I think still stands up, is that it was a funhouse mirror of the politics of the age. And Yeah, and, and, and I, I suppose that's the thing I'm optimistic about, is if, if, if Zack Snyder's film was weak, I think it's because so many people watched it who can't remember the seriousness with which we took the doomsday clock and the, the imminent existential threat of nuclear war. Um, uh, whereas this gives us a different existential threat to uh, wrap our minds around, which I think could, could be interesting. I, you know, I, and I, I kind of dug Snyder's watch when I thought he did some cool stuff. And my, and my frustration was my worry about this was like, I, I didn't felt like, and I could be totally wrong. I don't feel like he got Adrian Vate, and I don't think he understood a big part of the whole theme of what the comic was about. And that was what le sort of left me going, man, like, I, and, and it could be like, what it was about to me. And let me clarify that. But I mean, like, what, I, what I've heard, you know, like, hey, there's this, the, the, the bigger sort of thing there. And that was sort of, like I said, what, what kind of left on the table to make sort of this superhero film. And here it's like, I hope it's good. I'm not, like, I... I I didn't even check into leftovers because I said you know I think I think Lindelof can be good but I think that material with him is just going to play to like the kind of storytelling I don't like him to do and here given I am afraid that it's going to go in a place politically that I, you know maybe will feel too ham fisted. 
Yeah, I mean, that's kind of the the greatest thing about Watchmen is that you really don't know. <laughs> like, it's like, all right, is this brilliant political satire or or criticism about? leadership and and the all or nothing 80s and you know like all this or is alan moore just crazy <laughs> like you yeah. know that is it or is it both right like, like there was just some strange alchemy there where you're like i don't know if anybody i don't know i guess here's the thing rorschach by the end of that story for everybody's flaws and and benefits like rorschach's right Yep. Right? Like Rorschach is your hero. Rorschach is also this cynical and in, in our modern parlance, like alt-right misanthrope, like or like anarchist misanthrope who uh, uh, has this very dark, awful view of the world. Uh, and yet he's right. And I feel like that's something that is the beauty of that of that alchemy. Is that like I don't know if I trust that in the hands of somebody who's like, oh, it's just like now, and it's like, but it's, it's kind of not. And if it is, you need to be really smart. And <laughs> I don't, I just, you, know. you don't trust. Uh, hey guys, uh, I I I gotta run. Uh, uh, can we wrap things up? Let's do it. All right, my well, pick is. I guess we'll just end it at part one of our discussion of Game of Thrones. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm looking forward to next week. It'll be great. Uh, yeah, I'll be watching it from Rome. Uh, picks. But anyway, yeah, picks. Oh, uh, go go. Now uh, I just want to read Watchmen. So go read Watchmen. It's awesome. Anybody yeah. else? Uh, I will second Watchmen. Everybody watch Watchmen. Uh, Bryce, Bryce. Uh, no, I was. Uh, I don't. Have any picks. He hates no, Watchmen no. and doesn't think anybody I, I should watch. I know nothing about Watchmen. I don't watch men. It. That's his slogan. Well, mm. <laughs> uh, my my pick is uh, there was a comic book character called Supreme, which was kind of like the sort of Superman analog by Rob Lickfield. Lickfield and then he said, hey, uh, I'm kind of bored. I need somebody else to take it over. And he went to Alan Moore and said, Alan Moore, do you want to write for Supreme? And Alan Moore is like, yeah, all right, Supreme, but uh, I get to do it my way. Ugh. And he basically <laughs> took apart the complete Superman archetype, whatever. Alan, I'm not a big, like, you need to read this run of comics. Alan Moore's run of Supreme is great because he takes, it's basically deconstructing Superman. And why was he different in the 50s and the 60s? Why did nobody know who he was in Smallville and telling it through the character Supreme? Um, there, It's in graphic novel form. You can buy collections of it. I really, really, really dug it. All right. It's if, very, if, very if we're meta. Jumping on the Alan Moore train, I will say read Super Gods. I, I loved half of it. I hated half of it. Dude's a weird dude, but but I, I think he means it, whatever it is. He is yeah, he is wonderfully weird. There's something about comic book writers and stuff like Alan Moore, uh God, who else am I thinking of? Um uh, there's some of their. Oh, sorry, I'm thinking, weird... I'm thinking of wait, Grant Morrison. Yeah, sorry, I mixed yeah, up well, my Grant Morrison, another awesome weirdo. I, I, I mixed awesome, up my Alan Moore's and my stuff. Grant Morrison. Yeah, probably in the same cult and Coven somewhere. Ugh. So, um, yeah, all good, all good, all just crazy. Like you read their, you read what they believe. Like these guys are crazy, but they're awesome. So, cool. It's been after. Awesome. All right. I'm going to run to the restroom. Okay. Love you guys. XOXO. All righty. That'll do it for us here. We'll be back in a few hours with Core Killers. And, uh, yeah. Uh, you guys got any anything coming up this week, Justin, Andrew? I, I got a trip to India. Yeah. yeah. Nice. Nice. Uh, no, I, I'm uh, recording on schedule, uh, and then Friday I'm out. Very cool. Everybody check it out. We will be back uh, with Core Killers in a little bit. We're going to have uh, Brian Ibbett. I believe Ibbett's going to be on. So that'll be fun. Yeah. All right. Until then, bye. Bye. <laughs>